Those of you that knew Bernie well will know that he was obsessed with finding out what the figures and the attendances were at the various theatres he controlled as quickly as possible. I must tell you that Bernie would be delighted with the size of this audience for a Wednesday matinee. <laughs> but he probably wouldn't be so pleased to know that you're all here on complimentary tickets. <laughs> Lady Delphont, Carol, has asked me to explain the significance of the songs that you will hear later. September's song was Bernie's very, very favorite song. My Heart and I was the song that Carol sang with Richard Torber in the show Old Chelsea in 1942. Bernie presented that show, and it was where he and Carol first met and fell in love. And that song became their theme song. Almonds and, sorry, Raisins and Almonds was suggested by Frankie Vaughan as appropriate, but by coincidence, it is a lullaby that Bernie's mother sang to him as a baby. When Carol asked me if I would like to say something about Bernie, I hesitated because I'm not used to public speaking, and quite frankly, I was terrified at the thought of standing up in front of what I knew was going to be such a distinguished audience. Now, this may be to you, to you the liberal Jewish synagogue, but to me, it's like the Glasgow Empire. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, after my hesitation and having thought about it, I felt that Bernie would want me to say something, so I agreed. But rather than just read out a list of his achievements, uh, I thought I would try and make it a little more personal. Um, I must tell you that when I first wrote this speech, or a similar speech, I honed it and polished it and tried to remember it and thought, I'll get it right, I won't, have to, I won't need notes. And on Tuesday night, I said to Sheila, my wife, um, would you like to hear my tribute to Lord Delphont? And she said, yes. So I read it to her, and uh, at the end of it, there was a pause, and she said, uh, is that it? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, is that it? She said, well, it's no good. So I said, what do you mean? She said, it's got, to be, it's got to be something more personal. So I panicked and went away and sort of rewrote some of it and tried to make it a little more personal. Anyway, I had the privilege, pleasure, and joy of working very closely with that great big teddy bear of a man, Bernie Delphont, for over 33 years. And for those 33 years, I dwelt in the glow of his warmth and generosity. He was all things to me. He was an uncle, a brother, a cousin, a father. But most of all, he was a friend. He made me feel part of his family. Every night for about 30 years, at quarter to nine, when we were both at home, we used to have a telephone conversation in which we would talk about the figures of the theatres, general show business gossip, what was happening in business and happening in our personal lives, and whether he'd had any winners that day. He usually hadn't, but that made the bookies happy. <laughs> we had no secrets from each other. We discussed everything. He was prepared to listen to criticism, but strangely enough, he rarely criticised. He gave me a free reign as far as the theatres and shows were concerned, and if I did something that didn't work, he never complained. And if it did work, he praised me. He often said that his secret, if he had one, was his ability to delegate to people who were more intelligent than he was. But, he hastened to add, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> <coughs> He, he really didn't mean this about other people. What he meant was he delegated 
to people who were probably more knowledgeable than he was in the particular area that he delegated. But they certainly weren't more intelligent. Overall, Bernie was the most intelligent of all of them. Incidentally, I didn't mean to infer that I knew more about show business than Bernie when I said the other people. He was the best friend a man could ever have had, and I shall miss him enormously. Bernie Delfont was a colossus of the entertainment industry. I will leave it to Laurie Mansfield and Michael Grade to dwell further on his achievements, but I will just say that in the West End alone, he presented over 200 shows, including 50 musicals. Plus, he presented hundreds of pantomimes and summer shows. I don't think there is a single theatre in the entire West End where Bernie, at one time or another, didn't present either a play or a musical. His mixture of business acumen combined with daring, show business flair, generosity and accessibility were the mark of a truly great man. But he never lost touch with day-to-day -day reality. He was a, a stickler sometimes for detail, and he used to say to me, now have you looked after this? Have you looked after that, Richard? Have you got the first night seating right? Is so-and-so sitting behind so-and-so? So when I came here to meet the rabbi, uh, I got my plans and I got my stickers, and I said, right, these, this, do you mind if I put row C and stick it on? Block C, row one, block C, row two. No, said the rabbi. Do you mind, I said, if, uh, if I bring our own people as ushers to take care of the front section because they know the people who are there? No, said the rabbi. I said, do you mind if I put names on the seats? No, said the rabbi. I said, do you mind if I put little barriers across? No, said the rabbi. And there was a pause and the rabbi said to me, he said, you know, there is one thing that's worrying me. And I said, Oh, what's that, Rabbi? He said, I'm getting a bit worried about the girls with the ice creams. <laughs> <coughs> In Bernie's business life, he used a very large canvas and painted with a very broad brush. He had a great sense of humour. And he was very good at anticipating people's reactions to things and situations. I would like to share with you uh, three stories that Bernie told to me which highlight these characteristics. They may be a trifle apocryphal, but then most of Bernie's best stories were. In the late 50s, he was discussing with Robert Nesbitt the possibility of talk turning the theatre, the talk of uh, the London Hippodrome, into a theatre restaurant, the talk of the town. And Robert said to him, but Bernie, there are two problems. One is the cost, which will be enormous, and the other is the fact that you know absolutely nothing whatsoever about catering. Bernie replied, don't worry, Robert. I'm going to release this story to the papers, and I guarantee you that when Charles Forty reads about it, he will be on the phone to me asking if we can do this together. <laughs> And sure enough, Bernie told me, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> As regards his broad brush approach, one of the examples of this was in 1959. He'd asked Tony Newley to come to the office because he wanted to persuade Tony to star in a, in a summer season show. After a great deal of chat and talk, uh, Tony decided he didn't want to do it got up to leave, said goodbye to Bernie, went to the door of the office, turned round and said, oh, by the way, Bernie, I'm in the middle of writing a musical with Leslie Brickus. Would you be interested in doing it? And if so, would you like us to play it to you? And Bernie said, well, look, before I answer that question, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> Tony said, remember, it was a long time ago. Tony said, about 10,000 pounds. Bernie said, never mind me listening to it. At that price, we've got a deal. <laughs> that show was Stop the World I Want to Get Off, and it made Bernie's company over a million pounds. 
As far as his humour was concerned, when we were presenting Barbara Streisand in Funny Girl at the Prince of Wales Theatre, she came to him one day and announced, I'm awfully sorry, Bernie, I can't do two shows on Saturday, only one, I'm pregnant. Bernie said, but we're totally sold out for the entire limited run and we can't offer the disappointed patrons tickets for other performances. Barbara said, well, look, I'm awfully sorry, Bernie, but there's nothing I can do about it. It's an act of God. Bernie thought about this for a moment and he said, act of God? Surely it was an act of Elliot Gould, your husband. <laughs> On Tuesday, the 26th of July, I spoke to Bernie for the last time. I said to him, I'm sorry I can't speak to you tomorrow night, Bernie, but I'll be out playing poker. But I'll speak to you on Thursday as usual. On Wednesday evening, the 27th of July, as usual, Bernie's curiosity got the better of him, and he was on the phone to the Prince of Wales Theatre and the Prince Edward Theatre asking how things were and what the takings were. About three hours later, in the early hours of the morning, on the 28th of July, Bernie passed away. So he died as he lived in harness. That evening, as a mark of respect, every theater in the West End turned out their lights from 9.30 until 10 o'clock. So the theatre lights at the entire West End were out for half an hour. But although the theatre lights went out, Bernie's bright, bright light as one of the leading showmen of the 20th century will continue to shine posthumously in the history of the entertainment business. Bernie, there will never be another one like you. <laughs>